to B Star A. Woo! Um, here we are at the uh, Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry. Great place. Uh, <laughs> we have dumplings. We're gonna have presentations. It's gonna be super nice. Um, and I will be helping us get from thing to thing today. My name is Anna Azizi. Uh, I'm a performance artist, video artist, uh, experiment musician, and carpenter, uh, and most importantly, a former B Star A presenter. Um, I'm pretty sure that I was in the, the very first B Star A that ever happened. I, I don't remember what year. I've been trying to remember. What, what was it? 2015. 2015. Oh yes. Okay, and I think I did it two years. And the first year, I think I didn't have any sort of PowerPoint or anything. I think that I put on this outfit that had uh, little squeaky toys hidden all over it and like rolled down the, the aisle or something and then like left. Um, but then the next the year, I must have done, I was trying to remember and really, you know, hard to, hard to remember what happened. Uh, but I think then I did one my senior year that was pretty much just about my senior project. Uh, and my senior project ended up uh, carrying through to a bunch of different things, so you know the stuff that you're that you're making could be super useful. Could get you some uh, grants, some residencies. Who knows? Um, so before we get started, gotta make sure you know where the exits are. We have one here and one back there, which is probably the way you came in. And there are none other, no other ones hidden, right? No. <laughs> Great. Um, masks are requested. Uh, seemingly not required, though it seems. Uh, masks are requested in order to keep this event accessible to all who wish to attend, so thank you. Um, and to situate this gathering, the studio at Carnegie Mellon University occupied land that has been continuously inhabited for over 16,000 years, or put another way, over 600 generations of people. These people include the Adina, Hopewell, Monongahela, Lenape, Shawnee, Wyandot, Mississauga, Delaware, Mohican, Mohawk, uh, Onondaga, Oneida, Oneida, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora people, whose relationships with the land continue to this day. This land assuredly has many names. However, we know the Seneca called this region uh, Dionde Ga, which was understood to mean where the rivers forked. European colonial settlement and ongoing violent removal of indigenous communities since the 15th century shapes our relationship as contemporary students of this space. So please take this as an invitation to dig deeper and better understand our context here and to further research, engage, and support contemporary movements led by people uh, by indigenous people, oh sorry, led by people indigenous to this land, including efforts to reclaim sovereignty over ancestral lands, or sovereignty over ancestral lands, both here and throughout Turtle Island. So, thank you. Um, the studio, where we are now, uh, was founded in 1989 as the Carnegie Mellon University Center for Art and Technology in what has been the College of Fine Arts' library. In our contemporary moment, the studio serves as a laboratory for atypical, interdiscipl interdisciplinary, and interinstitutional research at the intersections of art, science, technology, and culture, which we're going to see a ton of. Um, <laughs> it's going to be great. Happy Valentine's Day. We're going to kick things off romantically with our only duo of the evening. <laughs> Which is going to be Eric Zhao and Jackie Wang. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Eric. I'm a senior in design here at CMU. Um, so unfortunately, Jackie couldn't be here today, but I'll be presenting for her as well. Um, I'm here to talk about a project that I've made as part of an FRFF uh, monetary grant called Jambo. Um, it started off as a design core class project, but we took several more months out of our own time and turned it into a bigger project, and I kind of want to share that progress, since unlike, uh, like, let's say a fine art auction, I actually have to prove the money went somewhere, so 
uh, here at Yahoo's to... Documentation? Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so let's start off with longboard dancing. What is longboard dancing? I would describe it as a form of trick skating that's less about go big, go home, aerial kickflips off 12 stairs, and more can you pass the vibe check. And so, as you can tell, there's a lot of different ways that you can longboard dance. You can do lots of stepping on the board. You can do no comply flips like the guy on the right. It's very varied and every person has their own unique style. And so what happens, we thought, if you try to combine longboard dancing with music, since music has a lot of different styles as well, could you turn those different styles of dancing into different styles of music? And so I want to show you the concept of jambo. So, simply put, as a one-liner, Jambo is the world's first rideable digital instrument. And I should explain, throughout this talk, I'm going to give you guys some lessons into how to try to work on these larger projects and make them seem impressive and just come off as very like well-fleshed-out, thought-of ideas. So first of all, Jambo is the world's first rideable digital instrument. Hold on. If you've produced music or know of people who produce music or know about the process, you might be like, is Jambo the world's first rideable digital instrument? And to that, lesson one, yes. Jambo is the world's first rideable digital instrument. You technically call it a MIDI controller. But what sounds more impressive to mo most people? Digital instrument over MIDI controller. Even if you have to stretch the truth a little bit, sometimes it's worth it to get your foot in the door and people interested in your idea. So, how does Jambo work? Simply put, we've slapped a bunch of sensors onto a longboard and mapped those to MIDI inputs, which when you combine to any music software such as Ableton, FL Studio, GarageBand, Logic, you can map those into sound outputs. So why does Jambo matter? Well, we thought that the intersection of two different audiences, skaters and musicians, could produce very, very types of work. For example, a skater might uh, experience Jambo in a way where the music that they make is more based on the style that they're already dancing, versus a musician might approach Jambo in the same way that they might produce music, but their dancing would reflect their music creation rather than a style of longboard dancing they had learned before. And so this was the process of building Jambo. It took us about a month during uh, spring of 2022. And as you can tell, we fabricated a lot of the stuff ourselves, except for the actual board. This is Jambo V1. Jambo V1 was completed in a month as part of the design class, as I said. Um, we had intended to take it further, though, because fortunately, Jambo had some problems. These sensors uh, were the ones that you would step on the board to make sounds. Now, the problem is we are not electronic makers in any way, shape, or form. So our sensors, obviously, we're not going to match up to like industrial manufactured sensors. And so when you put the board on the ground, even if you weren't stepping on it, it sounded kind of like this, where you just have pads going on and off and on and off and on and off, no matter what you try to do. And so we rethought the sensors. We were trying to think of ways to make them better, use better materials, better processes. And this is where lesson two comes in hand. We talked to a lot of different people to try to figure out what we could do to make these sensors work. Most of them told us it's either impossible or it's going to be out of your budget. But a few very precious souls from this company, Interlink Electronics, um, we basically asked, can you make us some sensors? They were like, do you have eight grand? We were like, no, we do not have eight grand. And so as students, they fortunately gave us some sensors to, sensors to test, and we ended up using these as part of our board. Um, and they still work flawlessly. So this is the building process of Jambo V2. As you can tell, we bought a new board. We dug deep into making this thing as refined as we could. And so here comes lesson three. When you have a project that goes on for three, four months, 
when many late nights are pulled in a row, you have to celebrate every small victory you come across. So when we saw something that looked good, when we put something on the board, we just celebrate, and that's totally okay. Here's like a goofy video of me um, showing off our little display where we have the board in place. Um, <laughs> but this was a big moment for us, just being able to display the board for different people. And so with that, I'd like to present Jambo V2, an improvement on everything we've learned with a little monetary grant from FRFF, as well as help from Interlink Electronics. This is what the board looks like as of today. Wow. Everything works much better than the first version. And you can see the board right now at Miller Gallery, which is right next to the Drama Building, as part of our Design Senior Show. Uh, as a small plug, our like, grand opening rece reception where everyone comes in um, is tomorrow, 6 to 8 p.m. We have free food, but don't tell too many people about it. But uh, please come. There are so many cool projects, and I'd like to hand this over. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Oh, wow. Really beautiful work. Uh, thank you to uh, Eric Zhao and the not currently present Jackie Wang. Um, next up, we have Neve Monroe Anderson. Come on up, Neve. Hi everyone, um, my name is Neve Minerva Anderson. I'm a senior here in the School of Art with a self-defined major. And I'm gonna do something a little bit different for my presentation tonight. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> um, this presentation contains some of my own work, but is mainly highlighting six things to consider when committing vandalism, um, and is also highlighting a lot of projects which I find really inspirational and which I just wanted to get out there to CFA students and you know people in CMU in general. So, what is vandalism? Vandalism is an action uh, involving deliberate destruction or damage to public or private property. So, that's what we're going to be discussing tonight, although some of these examples are pretty expansive just because I really like the projects and I thought that they were important. Um, why should we care as artists uh, at CMU? Um, because maybe we should consider using the medium ourselves, or maybe not. All right. So the first thing I think that everybody should consider when considering an act of vandalism is that it will probably end up being an immediate political intervention. So what you should be asking yourself is why does the message need to be right now? Um, this example of a project is from Bree Newsom, um, and this is her taking down the Confederate flag in South Carolina um, after uh, the Charleston church shooting, which uh, her action was an act of civil disobedience in protest uh, to a white supremacist shooting that had very uh, recently happened. And so for her, the obvious answer was why, to why does it need to be right now was because of the moment and because you know officials weren't acting to take down the flag. And so she uh, put her own body on the line and went and took down this flag and got arrested for it. But it also rallied a whole bunch of people and really, really got uh, people talking about sort of removing uh, Confederate uh, paraphernalia from public places. So the second thing that I think people should consider uh, when committing vandalism is how might their vandalism level access? So I want people to be asking, why won't this message come from authority? Are there laws or codes making it impossible for this message to come from authority? Are there social factors at play in the bureaucracy? Are the people who the message supports unwelcome in the space? And does the message make people in power uncomfortable? So this example is from a project that I was able to uh, create my uh, freshman year here with a grant from the studio, um, where I was able to print vinyl all-gender restroom stickers to degender some of CMU's bathrooms, as well as using a braille label maker, make sure that they were at a compliant. Um, and this project was really important to me because there was no progress in that vein, really, from the administration, and I'd sat in a bunch of meetings, and got a bunch of places and basically just been like, I can't find an accessible restroom, can you help me? And got a lot of no's, so I figured I need to make the restrooms myself. All right, the third thing that I think that we need to consider uh, when committing vandalism is sort of possibly cautionary, and that vandalism breaks the social contract. So we want to be asking ourselves, is this message important enough to challenge an accepted social contract? Here's an example which I think really hits at it, mostly because I think it sits right on the border of was it something that should have been done or not. 
Um, and this is uh, an example from this year. The fence was painted in support of the Republican Party on election day, and a student went and vandalized the fence, basically saying, don't vote for these people, they're fascists. Um, so in this example, we sort of need to ask ourselves, was this message warranted or not? And sort of does the breaking of tradition of leaving the fence unpainted, like, is it, is it good, is it bad? I don't know. Um, but it certainly broke a social contract and, you know, the school emailed us about it. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, I think that the fourth thing I think we all want to consider when committing vandalism is it's about what you say. Um, when an intervention isn't sanctioned by an institution, like even a legal institution, right, all that's left is the message. So is the message morally defensible? Is it fun? You know, here's uh, the Pittsburgh protractors. Somebody came along and just glued up a bunch of protractors all over Pittsburgh, and we don't know why, but it's fun. We, we see them and we sort of think to ourselves, huh. Um, and I guess I wonder, is it skewing institutions to make a fun message political? Is it inherently anti-authoritarian or suggesting that we have the power to sort of make change in our environment? Um, the only thing I think here which I wanted to talk about is like, some people use vandalism to put other people down, and I've, like, I don't think that's okay or defensible, obviously. Um, and I just, I sort of, I mean, I think that that's the thing that I like about the medium, is that it stops being about, you know, debates about, oh, should we let anybody say whatever they want? We sort of have a line in the sand that's like, no, you're not allowed to do it, so if you decide to do it anyways, you know, all that's left is what you say. Um, so that sort of brings us to the last thing, or second to last thing, which is that you are the stakes. I want everybody to think about sort of what happens when you get caught at CMU. It's fines for stickers and graffiti, potentially disciplinary actions. In the world, there's fines as well as jail time. And how do we deal with the knowledge that the stakes are not equal for everyone? Here, um, I want to highlight Aaron Schwartz, who is a student activist who used, M M who used MIT's open campus Ethernet to download files from JSTOR to publish freely online in protest of JSTOR paywalling publicly funded papers and in general the system of paywalling information, which um, the federal government came down on him really, really, really hard, um, and he ended up committing suicide after uh, basically his family and friends were trying to warn prosecutors that he was un like suffering mental health complications from the way that they were treating him, and they didn't listen. Um, so I guess that brings us to six, which is the aftermath. Um, what happens if there is backlash against your uh, intervention? And I think when we commit an act of vandalism, we have to also consider how do you take care of yourself and your community um, sort of after the act. Um, and this is sort of the CFA restroom where somebody moved the university's intervention to the side to regender a restroom. Um, so I guess sometimes the world is broken. Why are we waiting for permission to fix it? Fix it? Think critically and carry a permanent marker. Thank you. stuff here and uh, I have to make sure I do it all back on my way out. Um, so don't steal, but break and bring on things. If, if, if be thoughtful about it, of course. Um, all right, next up we have Daria Scott. Give it up for Daria, please. to be that person, but it's Daria. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stuff I'm interested in. I don't know. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. So um, the main elements of what I do right now, I'm working with actually that theremin over there, um, modular synthesizers. Um, well, not modular synthesizers, just synthesizers in general, honestly. Um, uh, opera and blues music and kind of finding ways to fuse them together, which it's interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so how do theremins work for those of you who don't know? Um, I have a little video, he's not speaking in English, so I'll kind of talk over um, this video, like a little bit. Um, but essentially, um, there's like a force field around um, that's a certain distance, usually like, I would say 6 to 12 inches. Um, you kind of set that um, with the pitch knob. Um, and you tune it to where like here would be your like C, um, C note. Um, and the closer you get is the higher the pitch usually. Sometimes it's the opposite. Um, and when you bring it further away from you, it gets lower. Um, the reason that they're shaking, he's shaking his hand, is because it kind of gives it vibrato and the other hand controls volume. So you have pitch and then you have volume. Um, and mainly theremins have been used in the past as like horror sounds or in opera settings because that just like that was what the original intent like was like when it became picked up as a musical instrument it was mainly used in the opera scene but i'm kind of taking that away um and kind of just seeing experimentally what it can do beyond just being like this spooky instrument quote unquote um so, um, and then synthesizers. I won't really go too much into synthesizers just because like it gets kind of complicated, but um, you have like your two main synthesizer categories, which is like your analog synthesizers and your digital synthesizers. Um, analog synthesizers are like those big synthesizers you usually see oftentimes. They're really expensive and most people don't actually use them. Um, they have circuits built into them. Um, and the actual waveform is con like, it's um, controlled by the instrument as opposed to like digital, which is like, it's basically an imitation of the analog because analog synths became before digital synthesizers. Um, and digital synthesizers are much more like affordable and um, they're often what you see like in computers uh, when people are messing around in like different softwares like FL Studio and stuff like that. But there are also like things that look handheld like actual keyboards but they are digitally uh, made because um, they are like computers. Computer goes beyond just like the casual laptop. Um, this is kind of vague, but I don't have a lot of time. Um, and then you have like your four main things, which is like attack, sustain, decay, and release. Attack is um, controlling like how fast the signal is like starting. Um, sustain is how long the note usually is going to be held for. Decay is how long it takes for your like sound to begin to go down and then releases like that and that ending point to where um, how long it takes for that note to completely go back to zero um, and just stuff that I'm working on um, I guess like these two sentences is kind of it just like I'm interested in voices cutting through chaos um, and finding guidance through this chaos world um so often i will use like a lot of like electronic music to frame um i guess the world and i'm speaking through this world and navigating through that world and i also do use performance to inform that as well um and i'm working on an ap and blah 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 and i have a lot of time <laughs> um and um, no, I think that's pretty good. I guess I'll talk about the tactility, presence, timelessness, and technicality. 
Um, tactility is about, it's a part of my performance where me as a performer, I need to communicate to the audience and I want to perform and I want like, even though I'm using these electronic elements, I don't want people to feel like I'm behind a keyboard or like behind a computer. So like that's why, for example, I've been experimenting with the theremin, um, which goes to presence, which also goes to like timelessness, where I want interpretations of my piece to like be able to be done and just like, I don't want anything too specific um, in terms of like narrative. Of course there is a personal narrative to me, but I also want people to be able to experience um, something more personal to them. Um, I'm almost out of time. Um, but I also like kind of had this question, <laughs> which is electronic music accessible to everyone um, beyond just like, um, I guess in terms of understanding it, I feel like if you don't understand the history, a lot of it can just seem, feel like things. Um, <laughs> like you just see these things and somehow this beautiful music comes up and I wonder if there's just a way to make this easier for people just generally to be able to relate to and create themselves. Um, I think MIDI is doing a great job with that, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, and I have one more. Uh, is, I was wondering if B star A could possibly be another crit space, because for me as a BFA, I sometimes feel like crit doesn't always give me what I need in terms of like pushing my projects further, and I think having a space where we can be more of a community um, and talk about our projects on a more personal level um, outside of the classroom would be great. So that's something, a suggestion. Um, I'm out of time, I'm sorry. But. Thank you so much for that. Um, if uh, Leia could head up forward, perfect. Um, so wonderful. Um, in, in case y'all didn't know, uh, the main library, Carnegie Library, just down the street, um, has lots of uh, synthesizers and modular synthesizers, um, and I think they even have some like analog modular synthesizers with all of the with all of the cables coming out of it, and theremins that um, you can go and just use. They're they're set up. So as far as accessibility goes. Um, as far as actually uh, messing around with stuff. That's awesome. Um, oh, great. Next up is uh, Leia Minsky. Take it away. If you do not know me, my name is Leia Minsky. I am a junior BFA major, and I work, I work mostly in animation, but I also explore in other media. Um, if you do know me, you'll know that I work a lot with blobs. I love blobs, I love squishy textures. Um, and I wanted to do this presentation on blobs so I could share some of the reasons why I find them so wonderful and some of the observations I've picked up along the way. I'm first gonna read a definition that I really like from a book. Um, called Entering the Blobosphere, Amusing on Blobs by Laura Hyunji Kim, who coined the term um, blobservation. Did you see it? A blob holds the potential to transform and transcend expectations that derive from all shapes and forms. To emerge in the world, in this context, a blob operates as a vehicle for heightening awareness towards intuitive and sensible meaning-making activities that occur in the everyday and facilitates the process of perceptual reconfiguration. Oh, here is some of my own work exploring blobs. Uh, just some fun stuff. Not all finished pieces. You know the deal. Um, all right, so to start, I'm gonna talk about blobs in nature first. 
So technically, there are no perfect circles in nature. There are no perfect squares or straight lines. Everything has a slight curve, even if it appears straight. This idea of perfect and straight forms is something that's really human made. And a vast majority of the things that humans construct are rectangular, and when done right, they are perfect. We usually design large things to be made from smaller pieces, and flat surfaces and right angles make this more efficient. In this way, everything is planned and under control. Nature, however, is made for adaptation. It is malleable and can be pushed and prodded, still while maintaining its form. It's in constant fluctuation. Expanding this to talk about artwork. Um, the strength of the blob is its ambiguity. If we look at the bean, for example, take it out of its context of being the bean and look at it for what it does really well. Its silhouette is seamless with its environment. It's reflecting the environment around it. And again, it's ambiguous. It, it fits in. It doesn't try to take itself out of its surroundings. Um, if we look at uh, Mu Boyan's work on the lower left, he is inviting us to look at the rippling, the swelling, the roundness of the figures. It's strangely appealing and strongly ambiguous. And even in its peculiarity, it's really wonderful. At least, I think so. <laughs> um, if we think about blobs and culture, um, I, I, was, I was sort of, I was thinking about the, the booba kiki effect, if you've ever heard of that. It's this uh, experiment where if you say the word booba or kiki to someone, no matter what their language or culture is, they will automatically assume that booba connotates something round and kiki connotates something sharp. And um, I, uh, this has sort of been a point of interest for me in thinking about why, sorry, I can't do things um, on the fly, um, why this desire to come back to the natural and tactile correlates to comfort and softness. Um, thinking about um, moments in time post-crisis, so like after World War II, um, there was a resurgence in blob furniture, blob style, um, and uh, um, <clears throat> another example is um, in the 90s, like the Tomogachi toy, it's just like this friendly blob creature. And again, we're connotating blobs with friendly, fig friendly figures. Um, another example up here is like the slime craze after COVID. Uh, COVID was this period of time where uh, people felt constrained and blobs or playing with blobs allowed people to break free of that. Um, and to wrap this up, uh, that's sort of the point of interest for me, is um, wondering why uh, these, these forms are um, a, a, a symbol of freedom and hope for people. Thank you so much, Alaya, Nancy, give it up. Olivia's going to be up next. So you can I definitely, over the pandemic, got a very sweet blob of my own named Mr. Dream Surprise. He's a little cat. And I've been lately actually very worried about some other blobs that are on his chin. He's got all these little blobs that I've learned 
is feline acne. Who knew? Really cool. Um, so, you know, sometimes you want to be concerned about the blobs on your blob. Great. All right, up next we have Olivia Canali. Give it up. So I'm just going to talk about, similarly, just some stuff that inspires me. I think interactive film tends to get kind of a bad rap, and I'm here to just talk about why I love it, why it inspires me, and just kind of like rapid fire go through some inspiring projects that maybe somebody else can be inspired to. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm currently a fifth year um, film and art major, minor in game design. And I really like children's media and interactive work and kind of bringing that into the educational space, um, but also just figuring out what interactive actually means and how to be intentional about it um, to kind of go beyond the novelty of the tech. So, yeah, I will just give like a little brief like overview of what I mean by interactive film. A little bit about my projects, but mainly the inspiration for those projects and just in general. So I think what people think about a lot nowadays, which is weird because it wasn't what um, people thought about when I was a freshman and I was telling them about this, but now we have Bandersnatch kind of as this cultural icon to latch onto when people talk about interactive film. Um, so I think that's interesting, but it goes way beyond this and it has a long history beforehand, which I don't have the time in the world to talk about, but just some like things to latch onto is this idea of interactive film, interactive movie, or FMV which FMV stands for full motion video, and even though it could be applicable to everything, I think that term is highly associated with the 90s. A lot of like VHS tapes that would be put in, and you interact with a, a board game, or um, you interact via senses, or smell, and lots of different things like this. Um, so yeah, interactivity, I think we think about buttons, but could also be an unconscious interactiveness, such as where your eye gaze goes, or what your heart rate is like. And so I think that's very interesting, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, yeah, and I think that different types of the medium and considering its history, we can also consider all the way back to like the 1960s and 70s and talking about choose your own adventure novels and uh, role playing or tabletop games. So we've kind of talked about that. I also think that it kind of gets a bad rap in history because it emerged with this resurgence that was super just overflowing the industry around the 90s to the point where it kind of lost its spark. People were highly promoting the novelty of it and really just inundating the medium with horror and thriller games and not really thinking about the intentionality towards the story or empathy. And this is where it inspires me and we'll get into some projects. So my projects try to bolster that, that empathy aspect that question of what can we do besides just how do we change the ending and make an explosion happen or something. And it's more about how could we maybe create a better relationship of the audience to the character through this interaction. So Marty Melnick is a kids TV pilot prototype that I made that's talking about that and I'm currently working on this project where you're going through a nature walk and exploring fun facts and it's maybe AR, it's kind of in the works. Um, so some resources for people that are interested in getting into it, I'd love to talk to, this is also just kind of a plug of, come talk to me if you're interested <laughs> in doing stuff like this. Um, I use a lot of uh, Echo or EKO, um, but I also use Unity. I've dabbled in Twine and YouTube and Adobe Captivate also um, for doing that interactive video stuff. So Angry River is really cool, it's one of these four shorts, uh, thrillers that uses gaze detection to completely change the the like story that you're watching. The Bob, the Bob Dylan music video I'm just going to click on to because it's hard to explain. Um, so this uses Echo, which is free to everyone to use. I can watch that forever, it's very fun. There's like a thousand channels. Um, Many Worlds is also really interesting, and it's talking about this gaze detection, this biosensing 
but not within an individual, rather a collective audience. So it's not just your heartbeat, but it's everybody's heartbeats. And how does your experience change because of the person sitting next to you? Um, which I think is very interesting. It uses this biosignal equipment, which I've never used, but I think has really powerful implications for this medium. Um, yeah, so here's my long, long list, because I wasn't sure how much time I'd have. Um, I've compiled, I just, I am very fascinated in this. Please take pictures if you're interested. I've, I've censored out some of my notes um, that, I've, <laughs> that I've languaged. But um, yeah, I think this part's really interesting, though. I won't go into the specifics here, but the genre breakdown, I think, is really interesting. Because we can see how much thriller and horror has kind of been elevated because of its maybe like marketing ability to focus on like the shock value as opposed to the in-depth like intentionality of what this interactivity is doing. Um, so I think the ones actually like surprisingly the ones that are more like comedy or family friendly and there's a surprisingly very little for children which in my last minute I want to touch on because we see a resurgence now. Why am I talking about this now? We see a resurgence on Netflix right now with a lot of children's media. And I like implore and I just want to let everyone know like I think we should go into this medium not throwing it away because of the like amount that it was like researched in the 90s, but go into this new resurgence with thinking about and holding space for intentionality. Thank you. Once more for Olivia. Um, I am a person who spends a lot of time with a kid that ends up liking to watch the same TV show over and over again. And how cool would it be if, like, you know, there were there was more than like one path to take? Um, it would make things get a little less stuck in my head. Um, great. Okay, Joyce Zhang is up next. Thank you so much. So, hi everyone, uh, I am Joyce, I am a BCSE senior. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, which is that I make a lot of games, I like to make things that are fun, I also do a lot of mixed reality, both in AR and VR, some more practical for research, some more artistic, and I'm also really interested in propaganda art, uh, some in my artwork as inspiration, and some you have probably seen on campus before. But sadly, today we'll talk about none of these, and instead, We'll be talking about hammerhead sharks. So, why are hammerhead sharks cool? Cool facts. So, hammerhead sharks actually eat stingrays, and they're completely immune to their poison. They have 360 degree vision because their eyes are on the side of their weird head. And they have built-in electrical sensors that allows them to detect things under the sand. And also, fun fact, they're also somehow immune to mid-journey. So, what is mid-journey? You already know. I probably don't have to introduce this, but it's a text-to-image uh, generation program using stable diffusion. And the source of where I found out about this little peculiarity about uh, hammerhead sharks is that in one of my games that I'm making that somehow in, like, you know, it has you throwing your arm out, uh, we're trying to think about cool monster ideas. And I thought Desert Hammer Shark, very cool. So uh, I turned to Midjourney to try to give me some little bit of inspiration. And this was the exact prompt, and if you have noticed, none of these sharks are hammerhead sharks. So that sent me into a weird like spiral of like, can I make it generate a hammerhead shark? So first thing I did, you know, it's very simple, hammerhead sharks swimming in the ocean. Photography, for the extra realism. And you can see that it just kind of gave me like weird squashed sharks, sad. <laughs> Uh, but that's fine, you know, maybe it's because I spelled hammerhead as one word instead of two, so it's not in its word base. So, hammerhead shark swimming in the ocean. Still no luck, sadly. So, you know, I kind of got desperate and I was like, shark-like creature with a head shaped like a hammer. Realism. Uh, obviously, we have gotten some very realistic results. So, what is going on here? Well, the problem is very obvious. The head of a hammerhead shark is not hammered shape. It's a very T-shaped fish. So let's try that again. 
single shark stretched to be in the shape of a T, with its head on the top side of the T. Photography. Uh, sadly, no luck. And, you know, I was pretty frustrated at this point. And also, like, also if you just gave it a prop that's like T with fins attached to it, it gives you sharks, which is kind of a weird discovery. But at this point, I realized that, you know, I've been doing this all wrong. It's clear that it doesn't know what a hammer shark shark is. So me, as a prop giver, I need to distill down the hammerhead shark into its essence, into its purest form. So we have this. The gray vertical cylinder rod viewed from the side positioned in the center of the image. On the top side of the cylinder, another gray cylinder is placed horizontally. Two eyeballs positioned at the far ends of the horizontal cylinder and a fishtail positioned at the bottom of the vertical cylinder. Two fish fins are positioned at each side of the vertical cylinder. Hammerhead shark. So are you guys ready to see the results? Yes! <laughs> so, you know, and then at this point I gave up. But, you know, why did this happen? Obviously, it's because the data set. Um, Midjourney probably just didn't have Hammerhead Shark as any of its like keywords, so we'll never figure out what it is. But this kind of goes to a concept of computer science called garbage in, garbage out, or you don't know, your output is ever only as good as your input. In our case, Midjourney never really had a hammerhead shark in it, so it just doesn't know what is it, and it will never be able to generate one. And remember earlier on, we said we'll talk about none of the other areas? We're actually going to talk about one and how it relates to what I just said about hammerheads, which is propaganda. <laughs> um, Propaganda works in two ways. A, it convinces you about something you haven't believed in before. If I told you sky is green, you're like, yes, sky is green. Perfect. Propaganda worked. The second is that it convinces you that everyone else believes it. If I tell you everyone else in this room believes that the sky is green, and if you rise up, you're saying, sky is blue, no one will believe you, it would be a clown, and your revolution would never succeed. You'd be like, damn, this will never start a revolution. And propaganda also works this way. And how does that play into AIs? Well, AI is weird um, compared to like a search engine in the sense that it never really tells you where it got its information from and there's no way for you to check. Which is that it has the potential of becoming a tool that gives you just answers with you never being able to check where that answer is coming from. And I think you can see how this kind of plays into propaganda, which is that an information with basically complete authority being sent to you and how like that's kind of questionable. Uh, currently, how kind of AI has gotten around that, which is just basically say like, sorry, no can do, I'm very neutral on political statements, uh, no can do. Essentially, yeah, it's not the place where AI model. But do you know that one day this tech will probably eventually get there and we'll be getting answers on sensitive topics, and in those times, uh, please remember that there's always hammerhead sharks that does not exist in the data set. Thank you. one really hit me in a, in a soft spot because um, I, much like Min Journey, have been for years searching for the perfect hammerhead shark. And this Valentine's Day, it once again, is uh, just can't, can't be made, can't happen. But you know, maybe, maybe after we, uh, we need to just feed the, the AI all the hammerhead shark. Perfect. All right, Jennifer Shin is up next. Take it away. disciplinary artist working primarily in textile, food, and craft. Um, today I'll be talking about my most recent project, which is making papers out of vegetables and fruits and using them as um, materials for craft. So papers like this. Um, in my practice, I often gravitate towards things that are flimsy and ephemeral, um, such as to-do list or fruit stickers, paper ephemera, um, and transform them into sculptures using uh, craft, repetitive handcraft. I view this like time-consuming, laborious craft practice as a way to preserve these um, fleeting objects. Um, similarly, food, um, especially vegetables, as ephemer ephemeral objects, is like so beautiful to look at, um, only to be consumed and vanish before our eyes. Um, I wanted to think of a way to like preserve their beauty beyond the realm of cooking. 
At the same time, I truly love farmer's market and going to grocery sh stores and just shopping like for an hour. Um, so making art with vegetables um, is a great excuse for me to like be at the farmer's market and buy all kinds of vegetables that I've always like dreamed of having or trying. So combining all of my interests, um, I wanted to explore the relationship between food, art, and craft. So the idea of making papers with vegetables kind of came up naturally. Um, so this is kind of the process. Uh, since last fall, I've made several iterations of papers, uh, including a lot of molded papers uh, to perfect the method. Uh, I usually cook the vegetables, arrange them, and then um, dry them for days or even weeks with litho stones or book press. Um, and I have to like change the paper towel every day, so I kind of joke about how it's very similar to taking care of a baby. You have to like be there and like change a diaper every day. Um, very time consuming. So earlier in the project, I focused more on making different kinds of papers uh, from different varieties of produce. Uh, I use techniques such as weaving and braiding to like make different shapes. So this is a woven asparagus, and I've also like braided asparagus and wove leaves. It's like fun craft stuff. Um, and my next question was, what to do with all these papers? Um, craft is an integral part of my practice, and I wanted to use these papers uh, for craft. Naturally, I wanted to make books. So these are the books that I've made out of single vegetable, uh, paginated in the order of the slices. The first one I made um, was a single bosque pear book, then a radish, and then the most recent one I made is a Chinese cabbage book. Um, each leaf becomes a page, and then surprisingly, they are like really fragile, but also like the colors are all natural and. They're really precious, like one-of-a-kind book objects. And viewing each paper as a unit of something bigger, I was thinking about patchworks. A recurrent mo motif I explore in my works is jogakbo, a traditional Korean patchwork cloth. Jogakbo is made of leftover fabric scraps um, and was a common domestic craft for Korean women. Um, uh, to create wrapping cloths called pojagi to create or other textile objects. They believed that patching the scrap fabrics together was a way of preserving luck and giving life to the like smallest scraps. So following the tradition of Korean women making togakbo, I made a patchwork of radish papers. Um, I specifically chose radish because radishes become this really thin and quite translucent paper when dried and the way the light shines through kind of resembled the translucent quality of these um, fabric textile objects. So in this quilt, there are about five or six different varieties of radishes, and some of them were pickled with soy sauce or beet juice to kind of mimic the fabric dyeing process. Um, the images in the right are all the same Korean radishes um, dyed in different substances, and it shows like the really like subtle range of hues in just this one single vegetable, and there's just like this textural differences that I just really geek out about. <laughs> and then the another interesting part of this process is, addition to these vegetable papers itself, I make prints uh, with the vegetables. Uh, some vegetables were leaving these like pigments pigments on the newsprints and I thought they were like so beautiful and I didn't want to waste it so I've been making these like natural prints in a way. So these are some other prints. Um, yeah, so I'm like really interested in and excited to be like continuing working on this project. Um, I have a lot of papers ready to be crafted. Um, I think there's a real beauty in this like slowness of craft starting all the way from hand-making your own paper. Uh, as the time goes by, I notice the passage of time in these materials, um, so I'm like, really excited to be expanding on. Um, I'm also interested in expanding this practice to more sculptural realm, uh, making big and small compositions like this in the images on the right. Um, I'm also excited for the spring and summer season to come, so like I'll have more exciting produce and a 
the farmer's market will reopen where I get my most inspiration. Thank you. yesterday and it really uh, made me think about how this is like what Eric Carle wishes he was doing when he wrote The Very Hungry Caterpillar. <laughs> 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 yes! <laughs> yeah, just eaten, eaten all the way through the book. Um, great, perfect. Up next we have uh, Benford Krumenacher. Uh, take it away, Benford. Thank you so much. And as it gets smaller, the bow is thus defined. 
that's kind of just like a knob at the end of this like curved red thing. Um, and then as we get smaller, um, each individual hot dog isn't as well defined, but they're defined like in the context of this like sequential linkage of hot dogs. <laughs> And then they end up in a bowl as they get smaller. I guess the like the patterning of the hot dogs doesn't matter as much as like their collection into a bowl. Uh, and then even smaller, the like boundaries between the hot dogs begins to like dissolve, um, and we just get uh, I don't know, kind of uh, planes of meat in a bowl. <laughs> And then <laughs> a complete dissolution of hot dogs. <laughs> and we just get uh, pink goo in the bowl. So I had a few other ones. Um, we had ketchup and uh, those are sandwiches on the right. And the question is like, what do we do now? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> into a real thing that I could experience, but that would be nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ben, for that last slide was once again channeling Very Hungry Caterpillar, but it, I guess he was <laughs> far away. Um, super wonderful. Um, up next, we're going to have Emmanuel Lugo. Oh, Hi y'all. So I'd like to talk about a practice I haven't been engaged in in a little bit since the winter started, but mushroom hunting and looking for things out of the corner of my eye. So I started in summer 2022, stuck inside because it was really hot out. I was working this job I didn't like, and I really didn't want to be outside unless it was absolutely necessary. Um, and of course I wanted to point my practice into what was around me, so I started looking at the ground. Um, and until, I think this fall, the most, the closest experience I've ever had to foraging was this piece of uh, spray insulation foam on a New York City tree <laughs> that I thought was a mushroom and I tried to identify. <laughs> and I really loved her. So I wasn't really getting in touch with nature in New York. So I came back to Pittsburgh and I was excited for the new studio course, Experimental Capture. And I had set my sights on Homewood Cemetery as my sort of playground that I would explore and find out more about. And when I got there, it was beautiful. Uh, it was autumn, super nice, really hilly area. But I was looking. I was looking at the. <laughs> I was looking at the gophers, the deer, all the mammals. Um, and you know, I think to this day I still want to do a follow-up project as to where the groundhogs go because. They have a lot of holes uh, uh, all throughout the cemetery, and I'd like to categorize them and find out where they go. But so I was going to the, I went to the cemetery a couple times a week for like two weeks, and I was looking for that right there. Wait, that. Wait, mushrooms. Um, they're kind of everywhere, but it's really easy to miss them. You're just kind of looking around. You might not find as many as you'd hoped, and sort of peering through your, like, peering through the sort of peripheral vision you have, looking around, mostly finding deer poop. Um, um, you sometimes get some mushrooms. And I, what was I, why was I looking for these mushrooms? Well, it really wasn't to eat them. I was categorizing, photographing, and making sure I got as wide of a variety of species of mushroom as possible to collect their spore prints. Um, spore printing is a process that basically creates an intermediary piece of paper that underneath a cut cap. So a mushroom is essentially just a fungus's sexual organ where it releases spores from. And taking advantage of the sort of anatomy that it's grown, you just allow the cap um, to dry out and it will, will release all its spores onto paper. Um, so as you can see here, here's a really well-defined gill of a mushroom. And here's a video of me chopping one up, getting it ready. And essentially, these are just dustings. I think it's sometimes fair to call them prints because the slightest sneeze can just, no more work. <laughs> so 
it's a, sport prints are important for methods of, of identification with um, in the field of mycology. You can look at a mushroom's location, its shape, its color, the species of tree that it's growing on, but really one of the most definitive ways to test between what you think you have and a deadly look-alike is the spore color, which you can check in uh, a mushroom book, which I think we have in the studio, or if you're like me, your phone, and don't drop your phone in the cemetery, please. Um, but also, like, spore prints are really important for the rest of mycological research. So pretty much all methods for uh, storing spores long term and growing mushrooms in, in, in kind of controlled scenarios is by using spore prints and then growing more mycelium cultures. These are, this is a pink oyster mushroom mycelial culture that I tried to revive last semester, but it only got that big. Um, but eventually, if you keep your space very clean, you can grow your own mushrooms and start the whole cycle again. And now I had the problem of the fact that I had all these photos of mushrooms, but I didn't know which print belonged to which one. So it was one very long night of me writing down in front of each one the grave where I found it closest to so I could keep it organized. But eventually I got to scanning them and created these sort of high contrast, um, high resolution images of these dustings. Um, they feel kind of like portraits of the mushroom and of the people, in my mind, it was kind of a portrait of the life that was going on in the cemetery. A place where we consider very sacred, where we hold our dead, can produce new life and new personas. They, they, they have a lot of personality, I feel. So here's all the ones I collected. And there were a lot, many, many more of those mushrooms that I collected, but would not drug spores. So, I think this talk is just me advocating for looking at the ground more. Um, you can find some pretty cool things. You can also eat what you find on the ground sometimes. Oh my God. It's very delicious. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, up next is going to be Matthew. Great guy, come on up. I never knew that yeah. mushrooms dropped their spores like that. You can collect them right up. So many personalities, truly. Um, up next, we have Matthew Kobar. Thank you. Hello. Ten ways you can bend CMU to your will. Yeah. Yeah. I am Matthew, a senior. I do a lot of VR, AR, visualization applications and games and stuff. Not important for this talk yet, ish. Uh, disclaimer, if the system works for you, you should stay in it. Play by its rules, be obedient, and you may be rewarded. If the system doesn't work for you, you can leave or manipulate it, which kind of reminds me of this. The Sigma grind set. <laughs> Um, but beware, you are taking a large risk, and you must have a good idea of what you want in order to succeed. The following lecture will introduce you to new methodologies that can get you around restrictions, avoid requirements entirely, and show you ways to improve your CMU life. Uh, but before we get started, I was wondering, like, how many of you are not seniors? Okay, so we've got some. Good. Uh, you got time. Or maybe you're not, you're beyond that. Uh, in which case, uh, you can retrospect. <laughs> okay, uh, number 10. Oh my God. 112 term project. So, uh, David Cosby, who teaches 112, is a professor. And thank you. He's like, you should, everyone uses Python and they should use it for the term project, right? And then he mentions some people used other stuff before. Which got me thinking. <laughs> I do a lot of VR stuff, and I have just gotten a FurFav grant, and they're not called that anymore, but back in the day, they were called FurFav grants, for this project with the Bow Arts Ball, with, in collaboration with the Game Creation Society. So I'm like, hey, hey David, I'm kind of doing a lot. Can I do this? It's in C++, I promise. And he's like, sure. <laughs> So, so this turns into a, a two-year project um, called Fantastical Delights. 
and then it got exhibited at the frame gallery. So you could do other things for your term project. <laughs> Number nine. <laughs> Want to do cool things? You should get grants because they'll give you money to do cool things. There is, <laughs> there is the FERF grant, and then the FERF micro grant, which I've been getting. And then there's the art grant, which is, they don't talk about that. But <laughs> <laughs> then there's the BXA grant, but you must be BXA. They discriminate in two to five majors, even though that's the definition of BXA. Uh, so that's also variable. Well, and then there's a dean's grant, and then there's a search funding, and then there's the undergraduate research grant, which is easy to get, but that's nothing. Uh, want to do other cool stuff? You should do summer stuff, like surge and surf. And they give you units, and you can also take free summer classes. Cool, number eight, you can find free stuff on campus. Couch, it's in my studio now. <laughs> other stuff. I found like a Mac, two Macs, they're pretty cool. Then they fell in the summer. Uh, other stuff. Monitors. I found so many monitors, I actually started selling them at Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. <laughs> Blocked by the system but want to take class? Just ask, bro. Like write an email. Uh, usually they say yes if you provide a good enough reason. Number six. There's a class called Concepts. Some people think it's pretty easy, but I think it's pretty hard, and then there's people who agree with me. You could skip it for 122, which is a CS class. Uh, but they're like, don't do that. See, strongly advised that you take it? But that's the thing, implication, strongly advised. Strongly advised means it's optional, because they advise you. They don't, they're not like, you should take this. See, they're wrong. <laughs> Number five, associate with labs and do research. They pay, but they also pay in units, which is useful if you need GPA boosts after concepts. You learn quite a bit. You can get, you can prepare for masters or PhD by doing papers, and you can get friends. You can get office space. You can get access to weird places. You can do fun bonding activities in New Simon, and you could go on trips for free. Well, well, the grants pay for it, but you get the point. <laughs> no. Number four. <laughs> you can do internships during the semester. They give money, but most importantly, units. Useful if you need GPA boost after other classes. See, this was my uh, schedule last spring. Notice this. <laughs> So it was pretty productive. They made me go to Cleveland. <laughs> Number three. The same is pretty big. You should explore it and partake in traditions, like covering the fence with water so no one else can paint it. <laughs> you can explore the rules of CMU. Uh, I didn't do that, I swear. Uh, you can barbecue on the fence, well, at the fence, not on top of it, you can burn. It's made of flammable materials. And you could explore weird places on campus beneath the ground. That's Amherstlake E floor, which is not a steam tunnel. Uh, number two, uh, read, Rand listen to Randy Pouch. She says brick walls are not there to keep us out. They're there to, the brick walls are there to give us a chance and to show us how badly we want something. Well, if you want something badly enough, Break that brick wall, and number one, make your own major, which is like, oh, you have requirements? You just need to write a proposal and get some signatures and talk to your advisor today about doing, well, not today, but like tomorrow. Um, so basically, you can like choose the classes which count towards your graduation, and the ones you don't like, you don't need to take them. You just need to provide a good enough explanation. And it's honestly a good thing, and I did that. I used to be an art student, and then I was like, I want to do BCSA, and then I realized BCSA won't make me do VR stuff at school, which is, defeats the point. So I was like, I'll make my own major, so I can do that, and that's what I did. So, you know, bend CMU to your will. Uh, there's a lot of slides. <laughs> you could do it too. Thank you.
Um, I, I was also a student-defined major, and the only thing that they really make you like not be able to change is what you call the major, but you can like justify any classes. So I, when I was like a sophomore, called it called my major experimental theater and sculptural performance, which I don't really know what it what it meant. <laughs> I was trying to be both like very specific and very broad, and also uh, just I really wanted to be able to take classes in technical theater in the School of Trauma, which is a conservatory. <laughs> Um, great, awesome. Up next we have Anastasia Jungle. Give it up. Sorry, this was, okay, I think that's loud enough. Hi everyone, I'm Anastasia and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pretty much my current art practice, which is like the evolution of that, bless you. Um, <laughs> Okay, so something that I think has been pretty present in my art practice is um, like struggles with my identity um, and perception and like literally the classic joke thing of like nobody perceived me, don't even think about me. Um, so that's kind of been like an ongoing thing. Um, and this at some point came up in therapy actually and my therapist brought up this point um, to me because I was having another moment of like, I don't know who I am and she's like, well actually the person that you are is composed of like the identity that you put out to the world and how others perceive that which is reflected back on you and also informs your identity. So that brought up this question for me of like if I am the self others perceive me to be, who am I when I'm not perceived? Um, so that kind of broadened this thing that I was thinking about already with like how I'm viewed, how I'm perceived, how I perceive others um, and like what that means for the time I spend alone and how the ways I am when I'm alone inform my identity. Um, and I started thinking more about like time I do spend alone, especially moments that I have a lot of shame over and I think a lot of that was like rooted in moments in my childhood when I kind of took refuge in like media and my electronics and all of that and kind of like the really weird shit that I was consuming during that time. Um, so I started to go back into this media and we have some fun little examples here which is this really strange thing I found I think on Tumblr of Twilight Sparkle crying because her like 4chan boyfriend broke up with her and then the classic like sexy like sim customization and like you know give her the big boobs and whatnot and and also just like the parasocial relationships within that and like the inherent absurdism of it and especially like as a child viewing it. Um, so these are some more examples of that. Um, yeah, we have, I actually was thinking, I wish I'd put this in there, but there's like this thing called Rainbow Factory and it's like basically just like making one of the sweetest things in My Little Pony basically about like murder. Um, so I found all of that really interesting, like looking at it from kind of like a young adult perspective um, so that kind of just became this really important thing to me, like delving back into it. Um, and I ended up making my final piece for like all classes last semester. I'm a freshman, so I had to take like all of the foundational classes. And I was like, what if I just combined it and like created this parody installation piece of my childhood bedroom? And that led to this, which had like a video piece and a bunch of soft sculpture. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, but most of it was composed of these like monoprint transfers that I started doing um, and they are basically Photoshop collages composed of the stuff that I was just talking about um, to kind of like, I don't know, try to like figure out how to navigate like these weird fake like internet landscapes. Um, so these are some more examples of that. I have. I really don't know how many I made. It's somewhere between like 50 and 100, and a lot of them are documented, but quite a few aren't because I like gave them away or I sold them. Um, so moving forward, like most importantly, I'm always interested in this weird media, I think, and like continuing the transfers because they're really important to me and they feel like a weird sense of like therapy. I don't know. Um, so that's something I'm always interested in talking to people about. I did like a weird kind of sitting on the ground like tabling thing at the art market during open studios and I ended up having like quite a few interesting conversations with people about similar experiences they had. So if anybody wants to reach out, I have like some contact stuff uh, in the last slide. And then 
I'm sorry, I have to read this part because <laughs> it's hard. Um, yeah, so I'm just like interested kind of in like removing these objects, these weird like false landscape internet things um, from their context and then like existing in as much of a void as they can. It's kind of similar to Benford's like pure picnic thing. Um, so I'm not really sure how that's going to manifest, but we will find out. And here are my art and personal Instagrams and my Wix site that has a contact form. You can send me emails. Ooh. Wow, they probably had the most impressive time, time-based <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So whoever's next can go really long if they want. Just kidding. Um, great. Up next we have, oh, and last, yeah, you're closing things out. We're going to have Will Rinkoff. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, no, no. <laughs> it'll, it'll go off and then I'll be like, ah, quit it, and then I'll just continue. So, um, what is my practice? Just kidding, I'm not going to talk at all, at all about that. This is a presentation I gave uh, for, a, for a class I took last year called Art and Machine Learning. And the presentation is on single character inputs <laughs> to AI, but I'll, I'll get into that. So this was the inspiration. Last year I had the privilege to attend this awesome conference in San, San Francisco called the Algorithmic Art Assembly, which I saw, where I saw Ross Goodwin, who does a lot of work in AI-generated um, poetry and literature, um, Gave a, gave a talk and demoed one of his um, ChatGPT to like custom setups for generating poetry, and I suggested that he, um, I suggested that he use the symbols emoji, which for a long time I'm sure this data is no longer available because you know we're the Twitter API, but was the least consistently the least used emoji on Twitter, and, and I love it. It's just like what is it trying to be? Um, and I said, hey, generate the, the poem from that. And am I going to? Oh, it's just really fine. The vast, the unspeakable, the eternal, the infinite, the formless, the day, the formless, the day, forgetfulness, formlessness, the profoundest ignorance, the unbought. Okay, what's that? Is it's not super important the poem, but what is important is what kind of result it gave. And now, I, I had this slide that was going over, like comparing what I thought that response was, you know, in the context of a rubric. This is all the things that the rubric asked for, by the way. So it wasn't particularly impressive. Um, it wasn't a particularly you know, important contribution with a baseline original approach. I think it's debatable whether or not it provokes meaningful question, questions or imaginations. Kind of funny. I, I mean, in, in concept, it's kind of funny that one like weird, obscure Unicode character can generate a pretty, you know, very abstract poem. But surprising. I think that was a big one. I did not expect this. And, and there was another one that was generated that also it was pivoted in a completely different direction. I'm like, maybe there's something in this. Maybe there's something in to find to taking, you know, existing gigantic AI generated AI generation models, and just you know putting that. Like one character is just like this little nudge, and you have no idea where it will go. So, um, my new domain was Dolly Mini because I had very easy access to it. This was right before it kind of blew up as a meme, and nobody could get requests through. So the differences between that, th this, and the GPT poetry setup was that instead of text to text, it's a text to image, trained on image caption pairs, and it's trained on a smaller data set comparatively, <clears throat> comparatively to GPT two and also a much smaller data set than um, a lot of the image generation models you see now are trained on. And it drew from these three data sets, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, so, and, and my prompt input, I wanted to limit it to just ASCII characters, so no, um, you know, tilde, period, et cetera. So no passport control emoji, which I know all, like, everybody in this room is really excited for. <laughs> Means, 
I found some Python uh, tool lab notebook, added, added these small, very feature, very trivial. Sure, okay, now this is the fun part. Okay, what do you think the semicolon looks like? And if you know, you can't answer. Uh, dog. Dog, okay. Nope. Women of Indian descent. What? <laughs> what about left curly brick? Cool window. Little nose. Little smile. Nope. Women of Indian descent. <laughs> what about percent? Anybody have a guess? No, it's just regular, like, kind of abstract stuff. But don't worry, period. It's more images of women of Indian descent. And I created this triangle chart, which was the three most common th things I got as a result of the single character inputs. We got either abstract symbol, landscape, or a picture of a woman of Indian descent. And here you can see, this is a bit of a heuristic, but it's a lot, there's a lot of concentrated up here. And not a lot of, you know, not a lot of abstract singles, uh, symbols. So my first thought was, what on, why? So what is in those data sets? How is this getting this output? And how are they filtering text? And so I dug into the papers that um, behind each of those data sets. Um, here's what they said. You can see over five billion images from about one billion English web pages. They're just scraping images, but they always like to dance around, you know, saying we're web scraping. Um, okay, well-formed captions should have high unique word ratio covering various, like, it's such and such, so and so, everything about words, nothing about punctuation, um, blah, blah, blah. What do you think the caption for this is? This is from the actual data set. Well, none of you are going to guess it. It's sending this angel your way, dot, dot, dot. It lights the way with its tiny candle space period. <laughs> also know that there's a space in between the, the T and the apostrophe S. How about this? Bridging a wonderful community. Ooh, that's a good one. See, I, see I'm totally ignoring this. Um, dot, 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 and local people to deliver a new bridge. Like, there are a bunch of questions, like, how are you going to deliver the bridge? But, okay. Um, this one, this one, I kind of, person, why you turn me on with your designs? Question mark, I believe I will be pinning some more of his work here in a bit, space period. <laughs> Observation. Okay, not, like, besides those goofy examples, not, there is nothing in the paper that talks about how they're handling punctuation um, whatsoever. And I think this is a fairly large blind spot. So I'm like, this has got to be a one-off deal. Like, the other two, there's research after this, they have to um, address this. So, this is uh, the second data set, which is basically a larger version of the first. Uh, the data was, you know, scraped in the same way, although the text processing was a little bit different, trying to keep all text as raw as possible, apart from, you know, performing substitutions for proper nouns. But like, okay, what do you think this is? I mean, you know what it is, but what do you think it's called? Beautiful baby boy. <laughs> I, I like that one a lot, but um, no, cabinet clock space, but no, dash dash oak, dash dash Jungins dash from the 1920s, 1930s. This, scary. I forget this one. Really good. Like, oh yeah, rare exports. Christmas tale. <laughs> but this is a good one too. This one is this, the source of anime quotes and manga quotes, space, photo, person, manga quotes, art images, fan art, thoughts, think, think, crying anime, random. Observation, also, no mention of punctuation. They're not, like, this is not on their mind. Um, third data set that they use. Though. This one diverges quite a bit from the other two in that it's just raw Flickr data. Um, so everything that's in the Flickr metadata is, is tossed in. So like, this, the data associated with this image is um, when it was taken, its tags, which are crimper and ethernet, um, this, the actual like data about the camera was taken on, which I think is pretty cool. Um, some rights, and I could, there was actually a, a site where you could search through this data set, search a single character input, of course, no results, no results, no results for tilde, no results for hashtag. I won't say hashtag, I just, it's easier to say. Comma, plenty of results, the word comma. And then I'm like, okay, are they, are they casing on punctuation at all? No. Oh, oh, wait, oh, they're doing something with periods. Okay, what are they doing? Oh, no. <laughs> it, they're, it, it popped up because they said time period twice and the period twice. So no punctuation. 
So future work, I think this is kind of a big blind spot. I think um, there is there are a lot of weird consequences of AI just because the field is moving so fast that you know there's a lot of nooks and crannies to explore, and this is just one such nook and cranny. Understanding what might have led to the consistent inconsistency, oh, consistency in the uh, outputs. Um, investigate text to image models, training with standardized grammar. I'd like to fill this um, time space. Yeah. Um, try other sets of unfamiliar single. There's, okay, there's so much to do. I just think that you have a very single weird result that prompts a lot of questions, and I want to answer one of them hopefully in my lifetime. Yeah. Thanks. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you so much to everyone who presented, everyone who came out today. Uh, this was so fun. I found myself. Uh, uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so inspired by you all. Really great stuff. Uh-oh. Uh Still, uh-oh. Still going on. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Can't, can't put that star off. Um, anyway, I put on my sweatshirt, which means that the show is over. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. Thank you to our presenters, Eric Zhao and Jackie Wing, Neve Monroe Anderson, uh, Dariah, Scott, uh, Leah, Minsky, Olivia, Canali, Joyce Singh, Jennifer Shin, Benford, Krupenacher, Emmanuel Lugo, Matthew Komar, Anastasia Jungle, and Will Rinkoff. And of course, thank you to all the Sayers, the Star Ayers, and to the Frank Reggie Studio for Creative Improv.